Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. And welcome, hi, uh, welcome to vlog 280. Nastiness in the Dark Academy. <laughs> For real. This is going to be a big day today and this vlog comes by request from S. Now S didn't ask to be anonymous but just in case, because her case was quite personal, I'll just use the initial of her first name. So a big hello to S. Now S has started her journey as a post-colonial scholar and she has a background in international development and also in journalism. And the pandemic has been incredibly tough for S and she wrote me a message to ask me to explore the nature of the brutality and the darkness and the complexity of this supposedly post-pandemic university. Let me read a little bit from her email. Quote, could you speak about the nastiness that we come across in academia. In my opinion, it's much worse than in other fields. From being called petty bourgeois in class to an animal in the market at a conference. So as a person of color and a woman, I do find it amusing that white men are pervading the discipline of development studies. I've almost seen it all and I haven't even published my first paper yet. I'm sure you get your fair share too. What are your coping strategies and how do you make sure this doesn't affect you? End of quote. Wow. So as you can see I was profoundly moved by this email and I wanted to do something. And also I think S's email was incredibly timely. I know that working in the contemporary university system at the moment feels like we're running through a razor blade factory. I do understand that. And so I am going to talk about some strategies for you. And in fact, in the vlogs that I'm writing following this one, all sorts of other strategies are emerging as well. But your email S was so incredibly timely because I've just read a remarkable piece of research, a remarkable book from a great researcher and this book actually explains what has happened and is happening to us. And I was so amazed at this remarkable book that I read. I was actually going to do a whole vlog on it anyway. Every now and again, probably one in every hundred <laughs> vlogs, I find one of those great books that I think we should talk about as a family because the book gives us new vocabulary, gives us new shapes to debates that we should be deploying. And this book is one of those. But then I received S's email. So S, what I want to try and do today between all of us from a lockdown Adelaide is to help us try and understand the nastiness. And yes, yes, things are getting worse in our universities and using this remarkable piece of research, I'm going to tell you why. Now this book is titled Dark Academia, How Universities Die. <laughs> it was written by Peter Fleming and published by Polity this year in 2000, uh, 2021. Peter Fleming is the Professor of Organisational Studies in the Business School at the University of Technology, Sydney. So fascinatingly, this Polity book comes from a scholar currently based in Australia in Sydney. Now, I'd read his previous books and liked them a lot. The Mythology of Work was published in 2015. I also recommend Sugar Daddy Capitalism, published by Polity, and the dream title of a monograph for Goths everywhere, The Worst is Yet to Come, published by the great Repeater Books. Now, he's worked in Cambridge. He's worked in Queen Mary. He's worked at the Cass Business School. So this scholar has worked in what I would describe as the top end of town. Okay, so he's worked at the top end. So we have a scholar here 
who has also worked in different countries, in different types of universities. And his scholarly area is the future of work. So perhaps it's no surprise that this scholar of work, having looked at international universities on the inside, decided, you know what, <laughs> I need to research this and I'm going to write a book. And wow, he has. So yes, let's probe the context of what's happening here. Now, I've often described the brutalising treatment that higher degree students receive in our universities as eating our own young. So it's so tough on higher degree students, we as academics, we eat our own young. It's a tough place. And look, as I always say, there are millions upon millions upon millions of remarkable supervisors and advisors out there all around the world. But of course, there are shockers. There are shockers that are brutalizing. And yes, they do change, transform and destroy lives. The question is how this brutalizing group is infecting graduate programs and infecting our universities. Now, there is no doubt, and I've always said this, that the behavior that we walk past is the behavior that we accept. So when we are frightened by a bully, or even worse, we see somebody else being bullied as a bystander and we do nothing. We accept this brutalizing language. Then this hatred, this rage, this anger that's often fueled by racism or sexism or transphobia or xenophobia starts to expand in its influence. And the problem is, and let's do this, the problem is, these brutalizing academics get on. These brutalizing academics are successful because they push, push their way into research projects, into research grants. They claw their way into publications. They frighten students. They frighten colleagues. And they behave in ways whereby they are the center of the world and everybody must bend to their ambition. And if you don't, you will get hurt. So this is the culture that Peter Fleming writes about. He describes our context right now as, quote, an academic bloodletting of an unprecedented scale. End of quote. So this bloodletting has a goal. I'm using that not only as a metaphor, uh, as a verb. This bloodletting has a goal. What it's doing is it's bleeding out the commitment to public good in our universities. And it's replacing the public good with profit-like business principles. Income, growth, metrics, outputs, stretch targets. Now, this change has been created because of the changes in governmental funding. So the public support for universities has collapsed in the last 20 years. And of course, what that's meant is that universities have to look to pay their bills elsewhere. So the increase in student fees, the necessity for international students to cross subsidise domestic students and the appointment of university leaders that can deliver financially on these new conditions rather than educationally for students and for citizens. So we now have, unbelievably, presidents and vice-chancellors who do not have a PhD. Now trust me, I don't romanticise a PhD. I know what a PhD can do and what it can't do. And let me just tell you something. I wouldn't hire a junior lecturer without a PhD, let alone a vice chancellor. They also, these vice chancellors and leaders, lack teaching qualifications. So they're making determinations about curricular design, interface management, learning management systems without any teaching expertise at all. 
And of course then they're sourced from a very, very narrow band of disciplines. So generalizations start to be made about working with inverted commas industry. And that's great. That's a public good. Working with industry is terrific. The problem is we're dealing with a very narrow band of industry. So it's particular modes of manufacturing, particular modes of engineering, rather than tourism. The music industry, food and wine tourism, sport, agribusiness, yeah. So what is also interesting is that these new senior leaders don't actually possess leadership qualifications. So what is going on here? What is going on is we've got assumptions about leadership. And as recent studies are showing, and these are remarkable, I think, what happens is particular groups of leaders go on to hire people just like them. And this means that promotion is stifled, diversity is stifled, and the groups that have been disempowered and marginalised in the past continue to be disempowered and marginalised. So what happens is in interviews, the panel looks for people just like themselves and asks questions and only validates the answers that they understand within their own particular life experience. So this means that academics, even in permanent posts, are frightened for their life because every single person is one restructure away from being rendered redundant. And of course, because of the nature of this culture, there's very few opportunities for promotion or to move through the ranks. So fueling this fear are these <laughs> bizarre new performance measures like private businesses. So academics are basically fighting to hold onto their jobs rather than enabling their students. So particular funding sources are validated over others, particular types of publications and platforms for dissemination are valued over others. Yes, it's quite cold, I apologise. Because you've guessed it, most people in leadership positions have never written a book They've never written a scholarly monograph. So books, therefore, are not something that is even considered to be valuable in the contemporary university system, right? And look, I was recently at a meeting. I go to a lot of meetings. And I was recently at a meeting with a senior Australian academic. And she stated that a multi-authored academic article is of equivalent value to a singly authored scholarly monograph. Let's break this thing down. So a 6,000 word article written by two, three, four, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 people is of equal value to a 70 or 80,000 word book written by one person. We're there. Now needless to say, the person that made that statement has produced plenty of multi-authored articles. We all have, that's not a big deal, and had not produced ever in her career a single scholarly monograph. Remember, the people that write books also write articles. We have the multimodal understanding. So, as you can see, these irrational standards and metrics are being summoned and proliferated. So, Peter Fleming shows how we as academics have been sucked into these false equivalences and these weird proxies for teaching and learning and research quality. Fleming states that, quote, the corporate university has cunningly interwoven self-interest with our vocational love for reading and writing, so qualities that intrinsically motivate academics, end of quote. Now, what he's arguing there is most academics love research, that's why we became researchers. We love research. But the Dark Academy has grasped at, has taken this passion, this commitment, this motivation, this belief, and channeled it into hyper-individualistic achievement and very troubling metrics to determine value. And so this means even really staunch critics of the neoliberal university 
monitor their Google Scholar Citation Index and reach sort of a level of scary frenzy when they're published in a top tier journal, even though they may have to be paying for the privilege to be published in that top tier tier journal. Wow. Now, Fleming brilliantly described this as, quote, uber-like ratings, end of quote. I'd, I'd give the bloke a prize for just coming up with uber-like ratings. I think that's fantastic. So, as you can see, this is not only a concern about research, it's also a profound concern about teaching. Because what happens is, colleagues, is academics hold our breath every single semester, right? Because you guys do a, a student review and the score comes back and it comes back to people's bosses, their line managers. And every academic holds their breath to see what their student evaluation score will be. And if that score reaches below a particular number, and remember I'm speaking of this as a head of school, I had to do this. If the teaching review comes back at a lower number, I have to put that academic under performance measures. So their teaching by that student metric is configured as, quote unquote, unsatisfactory. Okay. Now, we can all blame students for these bonker reviews, but actually undergraduate students are merely repeating back the language that the university is giving them to use. They are consumers. They are customers for a degree. They are paying for this education. And indeed they are. But the capacity to teach with flair, with rigour, with imagination, has nothing to do at all with the fees that students pay. So with these incredibly Fordist learning management systems in place, and these shockingly, shockingly reified rubrics with these micro assessments that stop students actually developing a wider series of ideas and experiences, we've got all these bonker, bonkers metrics in place for both teaching and research. And of course this is based on what Stanley Arnowitz described in the year 2000 as the knowledge factory. So universities are now the knowledge factory. So the people who manage in our universities no longer teach, they no longer research, they manage people who do teach and do research. And Peter Fleming builds on this argument from Arnowitz and he asks really the key question for us all, quote, how bad is it now to work as an academic in a contemporary university? End of quote. How bad is it? How bad actually is it? Well, the suicide rates of academics tell us one story. The quit lit genre of writing tells us another story. The precariat, casualised, zero hour contract academics tell us another story. So does the alt academic movement. So once more I return to the question I've asked a lot in this vlog series and we've been together a long time now and these questions really are what's the point of a university? Is it time that we revision higher education? What if quality research is determined by more than journal rate ratings and rankings? What if quality teaching is based on more than an end of semester student survey? Instead, our universities are knowledge factories. They're prized through increasing student numbers. And that allows us to ignore some pretty uncomfortable metrics, like attrition, and particularly who are trends? Women, older students, students with a disability, students of colour, Indigenous students. We all know that our culture is more focused on profit than people. We know that. And it's probably been captured brilliantly through what's happened with COVID where this false binary was created between the economy 
and health. Let's open the economy and if a few people die, well, so be it. Now, health and economics, that's not a binary opposition because dead people don't pay tax. Just for noting. But the universities have become part of this false binary. And because they are starkly underfunded, each university now is competing with other universities. So they're actually like destroying each other like a Game of Thrones, right? Because universities are competing with other universities for students. Growth, 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 growth. Because we are selling education. That's what we're doing. So managers are appointed who can sell education rather than teach, rather than learn, rather than develop knowledge. So S, you know, you're not on your own. What is happening to you, it's not you at all. This is the context. And to make you feel a little bit better, I wanted to share the story that Peter Fleming shared in the book Dark Academia. So you understand, even for a very senior person at a very posh university, bad stuff ha is happening. But can I say, he tells this in the book as sort of this absolutely dreadful story. Every academic I know would have 70 stories at least, much worse than this. But still, let's do Peter's story because he's published it. Quote, the most dreadful experience I had with an authoritarian turn in higher education occurred when a new head of department was appointed. While sitting in my London office, an email pinged in and I opened it. Attached was a memo from an administrator advising me of my teaching duties for the year and signed by our new boss. So at a recent departmental meeting, he told us that a few things were going to change around here. Zero faculty input regarding our teaching was a taste of things to come. The atmosphere grew miserable and I soon left for another university. End of quote. So this is the Dark Academy. Top-down management and yes, obedience. COVID revealed this zombie-like structure at its most troubling, I think. So many institutions broke during COVID because these university leaders had absolutely no idea how to manage multimodal teaching and learning options. Remember, they don't have teaching qualifications. So when it came to, okay, we can't do this mode of teaching and learning anymore, what alternatives are available, they panicked. Now, research targets suddenly sort of became a bit confused and messy because a group of academics were at home and having to enact homeschooling. So you can impose research metrics if you like, but a group of academics were at home trying to educate their kids. So what happens to your stretch targets there? And then of course the challenge of industrial discipline, the importance of obedience. Very difficult to impose obedience when people are working from home. Obviously I work from home in this outfit most days. Now Fleming described the rise of what he articulated as quote, and this is important I think, quote, arbitrary and unaccountable expressions of power, end of quote. Brilliant, accurate. So arbitrary measurements and arbitrary evaluations proliferate, often masked through the label of benchmarking. And this depressing tale that I'm articulating this week, and I know it's depressing, next week from what I'm writing is going to be even more depressing, but the depressing vista that I'm constructing here was really hammered, I think, by Fleming's phrase, the dark academy, focusing on the darkness. Because the dark academy is killing people. It's also killing the life, the passion, the spark, the imagination of the best teaching and of the best research. So S, there is no doubt that PhD students are receiving the absolute worst of the worst of the worst from these scenarios. Because in so many disciplines, you are needed desperately to pump out those articles. You are the engine room of a university. 
you have to pump out those articles. And so what you can see is the pressure on the academics is being di displaced onto the PhD students. Now in the old days, five years ago, casual teaching was available to help our PhD students pay their bills. Wasn't a lot of money, but at least some money was available to pay your bills. I get that. But the problem we have now is the casual budget has dried up. And that means that that casualised work has returned to the academics, so they can't even think straight. You know, as someone who's taught first year students for all oh, about 20, 25 years, you know, if you haven't got tutors to help you and you have 450 people in a room, and I have done that by the way, and you're tutoring and marking that, you have nothing, you have no life, you are frantic. So as you can see, that all these pressures are now moving to higher degree students. So therefore, how can this dark academy be managed by PhD students? So can we, and I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. I've got my red one. How do we find the good in Darth Vader? How do we find the light in this dark time? Yeah. Firstly, we need to have a good, strong understanding of academic labour. Let's get real here. You need to understand the academic labour force. We need to understand that the permanent tenured staff were, are and will continue to reduce in number. Now, that will create different types of job opportunities, but the job for life is over. It's over. And new modes of academic work are emerging. And that means we're starting to see teaching only posts. A huge amount of contract work, year upon year upon year, and postdocs are becoming, yes, permadocs. And also remember, about 60%, and this number could be increasing, there are some studies occurring at the moment, but about 60% of PhD students already leave universities upon graduation and go into other industries in the economy. So we really need to reorganise our reality. We need to ensure, and this is my priority with every single one of you out there, is I've got to get you organised. I've got to get you organised intellectually, and I've got to get you organised emotionally for this new type of intellectual labour. We also need to make decisions about research, and this is about you and the choices that you make, colleagues. Now, is it any surprise that the top tier journals are based in North America and Europe and run by corporate publishers. Isn't that odd how that's happened? Isn't it amazing how many stunning journals written for free, open access and run by academics, some of the greatest academics in the world, are magically outside of the journal rankings? Similarly, and I just want to put this out there, isn't it amazing how many of the non-European and non-North American journals, journals particularly based in the brilliant African nations and India particularly, who still have to manage this whiff of predatory journals. Now, in my experience, and I've published a hell of a lot in journals based uh, in the African continent and through the Middle East, and also in India, remarkable. And I have found the best refereeing and the best editorial management of any journal I've ever worked with. And remember, I've published in those North American and European corporate publishers. And I tell you what, when I've been working with publishers in the Middle East, in South Africa, in Nigeria, they've been amazing. So therefore, I want you to move into academic publishing with your eyes open, please. Eyes open. Now in the old days, paying for publication was called vanity publishing. If you did it, people laughed at you. Now paying, what are we calling them at the moment? Publishing processing fees, author processing fees, or 
open access fees. That's now become normalised as part of research. So to show you the craziness of the situation, and I did ask him if I could tell the story, and he said, yes, in fact, he said, hell yeah. Let me just tell you a story from my beloved husband, Professor Jamie Quinton. Now, Jamie got an article published in one of these top-end, top-tier journals, right? He's a physicist, they love their ranking in the hierarchy, so he got a journal article in the top end of town. Brilliant. And he was asked to produce the journal cover. Amazing. It's a real privilege to do that. I've only been able to do a, a front cover for a journal once in my career, done the back cover once, but Jamie got an opportunity to do the front cover. This is a big deal, right? Always a privilege, but besides being a, a great professor of physics, he also happens to be uh, a fantastic photographer and a brilliant designer. Unbelievable. So he went, yes, I'm going to design the cover. So at our expense, so it came from our wages, our salary, he bought the software to do the cover, learnt how to use the software and created the cover in one weekend. Fantastic. So worked his guts out, did a cover on his own time in the weekend. We paid for it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Now hang on to yourself. And then presented it to the journal. Okay. Even I can't believe it as I'm saying this. The journal then charged him for supplying the cover to that edition. The cover that cost them nothing to produce, they charged him for it. And can I say, a fair whack of coin. Now at what point do we all as a family simply state, this is bonkers and we value academic labour differently. Now when academics were tenured and reasonably stable and not frightened about losing their jobs on a daily basis, this labour could be configured as public service. Okay, well, look, I'm doing this for the greater good, public good, and therefore you sort of take one for the team. Oh, it cost a bit, but, you know, that's, that's fine. We've got a career. Let's enact the public good. But why should our students on casual work, short-term contracts, permadocs, be paying for your publications? And remember, I'm stating this as someone who has published 20 books, and I'm heading towards 250 now, 250 refereed articles and book chapters. And let me confirm, I have never paid one dollar in author processing fees or open access fees. It's possible, but you have to seek out the alternatives. They require courage though, to appreciate the alternative ways of living and working. And yes, there may be costs to your career because universities at this point are running these inverted metrics. And we also need proper attention to academic health. All this pushing of metrics and stretch targets and so forth is creating some extraordinary mental health concerns and of course high profile academic suicides of which Professor Stefan Grimm is the most public Ooh, and horrific example. So please think deeply about your public and your private borders and your boundaries. No academic career is worth your life. None. None. We also need to reinvest in our commitment to a comprehensive university. You know me, all disciplines have value. All paradigms have value. I believe in knowledge wherever it may come from. That's been my lifelong commitment. But the big loser in the dark academy has been the humanities and the social sciences because they're difficult to exploit. You can't get the cheap wins, all the low hanging fruit uh, from the social sciences and the humanities. You can't get the easy industry R&D money. Uh, and simply because they can't be exploited quickly, they're not configured as of value. And so they're marginalized and demeaned. And of course, the humanities and the social sciences make a lot of money, but just in a different way. There are alternative income streams available for publications and the humanities and the social sciences 
that don't appear within any of these metrics. Therefore, our commitment to the comprehensive university, valuing all our disciplines, all our modes of research, that recommitment is necessary. Finally, <laughs> we need to remember and value our students. Fleming stated, and these are powerful quotes, these quote, academics are encouraged to feel both self-important and yet constantly afraid of being outdone and overshadowed by their rivals, end of quote. And that is why academics eat their own young. Or to quote Fleming again, quote, professors benefit from the exploitation of others, end of quote. Most importantly, if light is to be found in the dark academy, we have to rediscover our courage. Do we as intellectuals, do we as academics, have the ability anymore to tell the difficult truth, to park the self-interest and find a different pathway, a different way of being? Every time you as a student, sorry mate, every time you as a student choose courage, over comfort, rigour over complacency, and kindness over abuse, then you are building a different future for us. And students, of course, are part of this dark academy as well. It's not simply you guys are living in the light and the rest of the academic workforce is in the dark academy. Remember, students are part of this story as well. Fleming did tell a tale, quote, a grad student a grad student was asking why I hadn't replied to his email. I confess that the last few days were pretty busy. I probably missed it in the deluge. After looking for the student's message, I discovered it had actually been sent during our meeting an hour ago. Because the immediate reply had not been sent, they complained. I swiftly deleted the email before walking to my next meeting, end of quote. Now, can I say, Professor Fleming shouldn't have deleted the email because that will perpetuate the problem. We need to talk with our students about why sending an email and expecting it to be responded to like a text message is actually incorrect. So PhD students also have to understand this dark academy. Even the academics that are trying to do the right thing are being treated badly. So show some kindness, show some decency, show some respect. Now I know COVID-19 destroyed any pretense that academic workloads were manageable and the new post-pandemic workforce is frightening. This new normal is frightening to consider. And I think Professor Fleming has done a great service to us and for us to enable this really difficult conversation about the future of higher education. We can use his example, we can use his language, we can use his knowledge to summon a different type of conversation, to create a different future for our universities if we just have the courage to speak the words and enact the actions. So S, I hope this conversation has helped you somewhat today. As I said, your influence on me, you'll see S in the next few uh, vlogs, your email will continue to resonate for us all. But I hope it's helping you understand why the brutalizing treatment of students exists, the rudeness, the lack of care, the disrespect. This system is brutalizing, full stop. And if we don't do something about this brutalization, then the post-pandemic university will end up being the post-university. But with courage and with conversation, we can create a new way of thinking, a new way of supervising, a new way of reading, and a new way of writing. I wish you all from, yes, our backyard, <laughs> love, light and peace.
tea and these fantastic birds <laughs> out.